Hello. Hello. So here's my story. I come from four generations of chemical engineers, and my father started a chemical engineering firm which uh, influenced DNA research. But growing up, did I know about that? Did he talk to me about science? Did he encourage me to be a scientist? No. He thought it would be great if I was a dancer. <laughs> so I went off to college, because that's what we did, and instead of following dance, I happened into a chemistry class, and I found I, I loved it, and I was good at it. So I started a chemistry major. And when I graduated from Brandeis, I woke up to realize I was the only female who graduated with a degree in chemistry, and what was I going to do next? My dad didn't invite me into his firm or encourage me to get a PhD and do research. He sort of told me my, his sister, my aunt, after she did a chemistry degree, she went on to teach, so I should do that too. So I went on to Brand, uh, from Brandeis to Harvard, and oops, I went ahead two slides. I got a master's degree in education, and I learned how to be a renegade educator. And I tried to get along in public schools for 10 years as a middle school science teacher, but my class was unruly because we were always experimenting and talking. So I took a break and became a professional potter for a few years. So then my life changed completely uh, at Flying Cloud, which my father bought as a, an inn in 1970. So I arrived there in 1980 with my husband, thinking that we would have a lovely rural life and raise our family there. But I found that I was missing teaching. So I started inviting kids over to Flying Cloud to teach them some dance, some pottery, some science. And all of a sudden, we had Flying Cloud Institute, which uh, started with a summer program. And this program allowed me to do education the way I believed it should be. I felt that children were natural artists and scientists, and what they needed were professionals in those fields who were risk takers and role models for what you could be when you grow up, and they needed the freedom to actually teach themselves and experiment and uh, get self-esteem. So here's our learning lab. We had woods, we had ponds, we even let kids build their own ponds if they adopted a frog and it needed a new place. Uh, we made murals out of moss. All of this, there were mentors on, on hand, professional scientists and artists. And we had a lab on the porch. And the girls were crazy about microscopes and exploration. And uh, the girl on the far right, Solana, I especially was impressed with because she was a fantastic sculptor, and her focus was amazing. So she kept coming back to, to Flying Cloud, and one summer she got to work with an ecologist uh, to do a whole week-long study of our woods. Well, it was getting time for Solana and some other kids, girls I knew, to go to middle school. And I had just read a study by the American Association of university women called Changing Girls, Changing America. I had heard our girls say, oh, I hate science, I'm bad at math, but I was seeing them being fantastic scientists. Well, this study showed that the school climate discouraged girls, and their self-esteem in math and science kind of decreased from elementary school to high school, and in middle school, most of them dropped it all together. So I had these middle school girls I had to do something for them. So I started another program called Young Women in Science. That was in the year 2000. And I wanted girls to be able to meet real women scientists. I wanted them to work in a real lab. This is at Simon's Rock. And I wanted them to find other friends, other girls who felt as they did. It was a fantastic first year, especially because I saw my dear friend Lindy Marcel, for whom I started the whole program because she was a question asker from Mill River who was kind of 
stuck in a boring science class, so I was sure that she wouldn't pick science unless she got inspired. And then there was Lindsay Berkowitz, who I'd known forever and was the sassiest youngster around, and I knew she would make a great scientist. And here's Solana in middle school in a chemistry lab experimenting with some kind of goop. Uh, as the girls grew older, we had to give them some high school experiences, and this is our first engineering week, and they were making boats out of cardboard and seeing if they could roll them. And this is a big engineering feat, I'll tell you. Uh, I was really thrilled that the program wasn't just serving southern Berkshire County, but we were able to contact girls in Pittsfield as well. So uh, the big jump into engineering for girls happened in 2004 when we got some women, young women from Tufts Engineering School to come out to our Young Women in Science program and teach about robotics. And Lindsay and Lindy just caught fire with it. I didn't, I, I, it was totally alien to me, but they loved it. And they took it into their classrooms, elementary schools, in their districts and taught teachers and students about robotics. They were influential in starting girls' robotics teams and in um, mentoring younger girls. So this is the middle school robotics team at Mount Everett, and the girl in the middle is Samantha Swartz, who was the star of the team, and she took on the mentoring role for younger children. Here she is teaching a young girl, and here she is um, coaching the next generation girls' ro robotics team. Well, about this time, another university women study show was looking at why so few women in STEM professionals. What is going on here? And um, they really found out that girls' perceptions of themselves is, has everything to do with whether they can become STEM for professionals. And they need female role models and they need encouragement. Uh, I have some data here for you which shows girls who feel encouraged on the right score the same as boys. On the left, girls who are not encouraged score terribly. So that was enough evidence for me to get to those third graders, fourth graders, fifth graders, and sixth graders and give them middle and high school things to do in the lab. Uh, they had guidance from uh, high school girls who volunteered in these girls' science clubs to help the girls. And we had lots of volunteer women scientists, including this um, uh, astrophysicist from RPI and this computer scientist from General Dynamics. They all flourished in this program, and I think to date we now have 250 girls involved in this program. And I was feeling really good we were, were fixing this problem. But the problem is huge. Uh, on the left side of the graph, it shows that in terms of progress from 2004 to 2014, we're actually going backwards. Instead of 20% of the engineers being women, it's now only 18%. It was sort of the same with computer science. It was 23% and now it's 19%. It's a little depressing. Uh, here's another graph, that big green section. 49% of the engineers and scientists in the United States are white men. 18% are white women, 2% are black women, and 2 percent are Latina women. That is not progress. But there is some good news. Lindy Marcel, pictured here, uh, is one of the founders of a tech startup in Brooklyn, and her company is being really successful. And she is putting in her time to come back to Mount Everett and come back to the Young Women in Science program and mentor other girls. She has a huge challenge, though. She was telling me this story about an event that was going to feature her company. And she was part of a photo shoot and fully expected that her picture would be up with uh, advertising the event. And she gets to the event, and she's in no, none of the pictures. And this is what they tell you, told her. 
They chose not to feature me in any photos. I looked too much like a model. And they were concerned that it would appear that New Lab had hired a model to represent a leader in a tech company. How dare they tell her she's too pretty? <sighs> well, here is Sammy. She's at Google now. Uh, she has maybe a little bit of an easier situation. Uh, she isn't one out of 20 or 30 women. She's there, it's one out of five women there. She come, here she is in a meeting at Google, and you'll see there are two women there, and everybody else in the room is a man. She comes back to Mount Everett to mentor other girls who are interested in robotics. But she's facing this, on this chart it shows that Google only has 20% women who are in the technology jobs. And other uh, technology companies, that blue line is all where the women are. They're, they're doing uh, clerical work, but they're not doing the technology jobs. Here's Solana, my dear Solana. She went on to be a nuclear engineer, and she's working in the Navy. And she mentors also. She comes back to Rensselaer Polytechnic to talk to other girls. Here is Lindsay Berkowitz, who decided to go the engineering education route. And she is here, pictured here at Flying Cloud Institute in their new office in Great Barrington. She is in charge of Young Women in Science. She's been in that program for 18 years. And I feel really confident that her positive energy and work with girls is going to continue to affect at least what's happening in our county. So as individuals with this huge uh, challenge for girls in the STEM professions, that's science, technology, engineering, math, we all can do something. We all know a girl we can encourage. We maybe provide them with contact with a woman that we know who is in a STEM profession. We can give girls opportunities to participate in STEM programs and certainly scholarships are needed because we want everybody to have a chance. And we have to talk to teachers and parents about how they're talking to girls and what their own biases might be because they have a big influence on how girls succeed. And together we can fight the bias against women in STEM. Thank you.